Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Cochrane Network and Center's Fall 2009 Research Webinar Series. My name is Adrienne Stevens, and I'm the Center's Education Coordinator. I hope you're having a great day. I just want to take a moment to thank the funders of the Canadian Cochrane Network and Center, those being the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and six of their research institutes, as well as to the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. Thank you to our sponsors during this funding period. And as you know, we're using Illuminate Live to broadcast our uh, webinar series, and those would not have been possible had it not been for the uh, wonderful provision of the Research Promotion and Development Department of the Pan American Health Organization, that is the regional office of the WHO. PAHO is the uh, valued partner of the Canadian Cochrane Network and Centre. And for joining on today, you may have no thank you very much. Uh, and just for reference, the way that we are going to um, a few things I want to bring your attention to. One is that from the recent colloquium held in Singapore, uh, the Cocker Web Team has very kindly put up a video a sidecast, so it's audio, PowerPoint, and video from the plenaries from the colloquium. So do refer to Cochrane.org if you want to see the playback files. And for reference, for those of you joining us from Canada, we do have one-click access currently to the CochraneLibrary.com. So I'm just going to activate uh, my web tour function here. Just give me one moment. I'm just going to bring up the Cochrane Library for everyone to see. And this is the Wiley interface, of course. Now you should see the web tour open up. At as a floating window on your interface. Okay, so if you see that, you just send me a happy face through so I know that that's uh, started to transmit through to you. Great. Okay, so some folks are seeing this. That's excellent. And so, uh, as you know, this is the, inter the Wiley interface for the Cochrane Library. One thing I want to bring your attention to, I'm just going to scroll down here is the Cochrane Journal Club. This is a new free online monthly publication brought to you by the uh, Cochrane Editorial Unit uh, with work from uh, Mike Clark, who's the podcast editor and the director of the UK Cochrane Centre, as well, of course, with the authors who author the review. And the idea here is that they provide you with an overview of a particular review, and this one happens to be an overview of reviews. You can listen to the podcast. You can download the PowerPoint slides with the idea that you could take this and use this for your journal clubs. It has an author profile. And as you can see on the right here, discussion points. So if you're, uh, depending on how you're accessing um, which um, operating uh, system that you're using, if you don't see me scroll down, you should be able to scroll down yourself. Um, so you see there's a document for discussion points. You can use the guide discussion. If you want to join the club, you can sign up to receive alerts for new uh, Cochrane Journal Club articles, so feel free to sign up for that. And if you wish to ask a question on the review, uh, there's an opportunity to do that as well. One more resource I want to bring you to uh, before we hear from today's speaker is the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group. and. Um, uh, very fortunate for us, we have Dr. Banny. He is a co-convener of the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group, and he's based in Toronto. So I just wanted to bring your attention to their website. And if you wish to get involved, um, then there's the opportunity to, uh, to uh, join up through them. And it's Georgia Salentia who uh, you email regarding that. So I am just going to um, uh, just take this. Oh. And I'm going to put the uh, the Wiley um, interface in there, and I will bring up the um, Cochrane Statistical Methods Group again. So it should be coming through on your web tour in just a moment. There we are. Okay, and so I'm just going to throw that um, web URL into the chat room that you can click on to. And I'm not sure whether the Cochrane Journal Club came through or not, so I will just uh, put that URL in as well. Just give me one moment here. So it's www.cochranejournalclub.com. 
and there's a web interface for that. So there you are, a few resources for you to use after the webinar. Okay. Okay, and so we have today's featured speaker, so I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Joseph Bayani, who is a senior scientist in the Research Institute of the Hospital for Sick Children. He is an associate professor of the Biostats uh, Department um, at the University of Toronto House within the Dalalana School of Public Health, as well as he is a part of the Department of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. Dr. Bayani holds an academic appointment as well in the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostats statistics at McMaster University. His current areas of research include statistical methods development uh, and application with a focus on systematic reviews and meta-analyses, statistical, statistical genetics and genomics, and data integration. And as well as I mentioned, we also uh, very nicely have him as a co-convener of the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group, and he is a great resource for us here at the Cochrane Center. His research is funded by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, CIHR, Genome Canada, and MITAX. So why don't you join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph Bayani. Thank you very much, Adrian, for that uh, kind introduction. I guess I should first start by asking everybody if you could show me a happy face uh, to let me know that you can hear me okay. Can you hear me okay? Happy face, please. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, again, Adrian, thanks a lot for your introduction and also for uh, everything you have done uh, to, to make this happen, all your efforts to uh, build capacity uh, in Canada and beyond in the area of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. I have to admit this is the first time I am giving um, a lecture in this format, so I'm kind of shy and nervous because I personally prefer to, to teach when I see uh, the people in front of me and when I have the opportunity to interact. Anyway, so I'm hoping so we'll have some time at the end of my talk for interactive uh, question and answer session. Uh, and uh, I think I will just go without further ado to my uh, uh, slides and start the session. So let's see. Uh, can you all see my slides okay? Again, another happy face. Can you see them okay? Wonderful. So, as you see, uh, the title is the uh, the title is different, maybe from what is listed uh, on the webinar series, for two reasons. One, because this is the standard training material that uh, we in Cochrane have been using for many years now. In fact, this particular set of slides. Uh, Julian Higgins and myself uh, used it jointly uh, at, uh, at a Cochrane Colloquium that took place in Ottawa a few years ago. I think it was 2005. And as you could see, as you can see on this slide, I am acknowledging MRC Statistics Unit in Cambridge, UK, who has done uh, pretty much everything to put to together this, this slide. Uh, so I gave the talk with him. So it was. Uh, um, it was uh, uh, basically his, his uh, effort to, to put this together. So I thank him very much. And I, after a consultation with Julian, uh, we have agreed to make these slides in a PDF format to make them available to anyone who requests them under the condition that the source of the material be acknowledged and that they not be distributed. So if you want a copy in a PDF format, please um, get in touch with Adrian after, after the seminar today. So just so that we will use our time um, uh, effectively, I'm going to go through the slides first and allow uh, hopefully about 15 minutes or so for questions at the, at the end. Uh, I have a fair amount of slides here, but in the spirit of uh, meta-analysis, not all slides will get equal weight. In other words, I will not spend equal time on each one of them. Some of them I'll just show them, maybe just skip them. 
uh, you will get them when you request the, the, the PDF just for your, for your file. So the purpose mainly for me is to, to try to, to share with you what meta regression entails and why do we need it in the first place. Perhaps um, in the process maybe uh, discuss with you when should it be used or when should it not be used and how can it be done uh, if we decide to do it. And so in, in, in discussing this uh, and how, hopefully we will also be able to, to see um, how, um, how to interpret results from meta regression properly uh, whether you are doing one yourself or uh, critically appraising uh, uh, someone else's meta regression. So what is meta regression? Meta regression in a nutshell, it's a statistical method that can be used for investigating possible causes of heterogeneity in a meta-analysis. It relates study characteristics to their effect size. Some issues that may be addressed using a meta-regression approach include, for example, does the intervention work better? It's given for longer, so this is duration of intervention. Are small odds ratios of the again, baseline risk uh, may be a factor in terms of differential effectiveness or efficacy of the treatment. If we go to uh, methodological issues, is inadequate allocation concealment associated with a larger effect estimate? And in some situations, uh, there may not be head-to-head -head comparisons for two drugs. For example, uh, A may be compared with B, and A may be compared with C. Uh, so when you have some indirect and B with C, you may want to use um, indirect evidence uh, and combine them. The meta regression uh, can be uh, can be an effective tool in that context. So, so here is a quick outline. So what's heterogeneity? How do we deal with it? How do we explain heterogeneity? For example, using subgroups just to, to start the discussion. Meta regression as an extension of subgroup analysis. Fixed effect meta regression. Uh, bubble growth, growth uh, visual way of appreciating potential relationship between effect uh, size and covariance. And we'll finish by, by, by discussing some uh, pitfalls that, that uh, meta regression suffers from. We'll, uh, we'll talk about a few practical guidelines and some extensions. So what's heterogeneity? Again, I think for most of you here, I would assume it should be fairly clear so that, so that I'll have to be very quick here. Uh, clinical heterogeneity or clinical diversity will probably uh, arise from uh, participants being different in terms of um, conditions under investigation, eligibility criteria, and so on. The intervention may be different in terms of intensity, dose, uh, duration, uh, et cetera. Outcomes may also be uh, different. So methodological heterogeneity may arise uh, during the design uh, or conduct of a study, for example, randomized, randomized versus non-randomized, crossover versus parallel group, that's part of design. In terms of conduct, allocation concealment, blinding, approaches to analysis, for example, uh, if you have to impute data to deal with missing, missing values, all this may cause heterogeneity, methodological heterogeneity. The statistical heterogeneity is also expected, that is variation in true effects underlying the studies, which may manifest itself in more observed variation than expected by chance alone. It may be due to, of course, clinical diversity, that's a different treatment effect, or methodological diversity, which is all about different biases. I guess before we start discussing about how to deal with uh, heterogeneity, 
maybe if we'd ask ourselves, how do we identify uh, heterogeneity? Um, I, to me personally, the best way is common sense. Someone who is doing a systematic review, uh, assembling studies from various sources, should be in a good position to um, to appreciate the kind of um, uh, that may exist in the studies. Again, going back to patients' interventions and so on. Uh, if you want to use statistical approaches, uh, you could maybe uh, start with exploratory analysis, just eyeballing the forest plot, forest plot uh, or uh, using statistical tests with, we know, uh, statistical tests that are now widely used uh, have some limitations, but nevertheless still uh, can, be, uh, can be used. So a list of actions you may take uh, when you find heterogeneity. First thing, uh, checking the data. You may have some uh, incorrect data uh, in in the study. Uh, I mean, in, in your in your example. So, as a result of probably a data extraction uh, error, unit of analysis error may cause that. But I think that's probably uh, something to always like any statistics to start with. Now, looking at the integrity of the data, the quality of the data is very important. But then the, the rest, the rest, the next few um, items here. First is ignoring it, which we don't recommend you do that. But that's uh, uh, part, I guess, part, uh, partly done by some groups, or you just, you know, not do any meta-analysis. In that case. There is sufficient substantial heterogeneity, and there is no reason to to combine them. You can still do uh, an excellent systematic review without uh, the, the need to combine data, uh, or you may want to embrace it or encompass it using the random effects meta-analysis approach. Uh, but this talk today is more about exploring, trying to explore sources of heterogeneity. Uh, of course, the focus is meta regression, but as you probably know, all of you, subgroup analysis is widely used, and other other techniques can be used to uh, explore heterogeneity. Uh, this is actually just a quick recap of what I said in the previous slide from a, a relatively old uh, paper now, 1997, by Joseph Lau and colleagues how to deal uh, with heterogeneity. It's a nice chart, putting all together, going from ignoring on the left all the way to explaining it uh, uh, or incorporating. OK, so it's basically what I just said in the previous slide. Here's just a quick example uh, from a PMJ publication back in 2001, uh, which has to do with exercise for depression. Uh, the standardized mean difference, SMD, uh, was in this case used as the effect, uh, an effect measure on the left, favoring exercise here on the right, favoring control. Um, you'll see just by eyeballing uh, this forest plot and the confidence limit, you could probably say maybe there is some, some heterogeneity uh, between these studies. But if you just for example, let's maybe go quickly, very quickly, in terms of the standard meta-analysis approach when we have just using the fixed effect meta-analysis, we test for heterogeneity, and after that, use random effect meta-analysis as a way of incorporating heterogeneity and do subgroup analysis. So let, let us go very quickly using this data. Um, so these four four steps. So standard meta-analysis approach number one is a fixed effect in which uh, we assume one common effect. So as you could see here, um, in other words, uh, the same standardized mean difference is assumed to underline every study, which is uh, which is um, I think. Oops, uh, sorry, I'm just distracted trying to see some of the text message. Maybe I should not do that. So, um, so uh, uh, there is one fixed effect uh, assumed. Uh, the finding, if we do assume that, is 
that on average here we have um, a standardized mean difference of minus 1.01 with 95% confidence limits going from minus 1.24 to minus 0 0.79. And of course here is, a, here is an absolute difference, does not include zero, so you may conclude that um, there is a benefit. Okay, now let's go to Again, standard meta-analysis approach number two. Let's, well, let's test for heterogeneity because we have looked at the forest plots uh, and uh, we felt that there might be heterogeneity just based on the, 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 overlap, the, the, the confidence limits and so on. If we do test using the famous Q test, the chi-square test, you see here Q is 35.4 with nine degrees of freedom. You, you know that the degrees of freedom for the Q test, the chi-square test, uh, is the number of studies minus one. So in other words, um, if indeed there is no heterogeneity uh, between these studies, on average, we would expect the value of Q to be uh, roughly um, around its degrees of freedom. But here it's more than um, four, uh, close to four times the degrees of freedom, suggesting substantial heterogeneity in the data. Uh, I squared, uh, again, I'm assuming most of you would be familiar with this. I squared is a statistic that was introduced by Julian Higgins and, uh, Higgins and his colleagues uh, not long ago. Basically, it's a measure, of, uh, measure that can be used to quantify uh, the degree of inconsistency across, across uh, the studies. In this case, 75% uh, considered quite quite large. It's uh, an index that goes from 0% to 100%. The closer it is to 100%, uh, it's not a good news. So this is just testing it. And now, if we go to the standard approach number three, is can we recognize or embrace this uh, heterogeneity that now we could you know, say based on the Q test and the I squared, there must be a, a substantial degree of heterogeneity. We need to do something with it. So if we try to incorporate it, now here you'll see we are not going to assume just one underlying true SMD. Uh, that, that assumption is relaxed now, which leads to an overall uh, average uh, under this random effect approach minus point minus point oh six with a confidence limit that's slightly wider than what we have seen um, under the fixed effect approach. Okay, so now that's just we, what we did effectively in, in doing a random effect meta analysis explain it. We just simply um, uh, added it to this residual, if you will, variance uh, that cannot be explained. Um, so the standard meta-analysis approach number four is, well, can we do a subgroup analysis? Uh, of course, subgroup analysis requires us to ideally identify a biologically and clinically meaningful subgroup a priori uh, before we look at the data. And we always try to limit the number of subgroups. That's uh, you know, always a good thing. So in this case, maybe if we feel that, or if we think that, uh, follow up uh, the maybe if a factor that may explain this heterogeneity, could think of dividing up the studies by duration of the trial. In this case, uh, we we'll look at two subgroups. Uh, those uh, studies that followed up. Uh, more than eight weeks versus um, studies with a shorter follow-up. So you can see uh, on the top panel here, the longer follow-up studies have, uh, on average, a smaller effect size. Uh, this is again SMD, standardized mean difference, minus 0 0.82. Compare that, compare that with uh, minus 1.33, which is a larger standardized mean difference for studies that have shorter follow-up. So suggesting probably uh, the longer the follow-up, maybe the effect atten attenuates, so the effect gets smaller. Okay. So now 
We have gone through the standard meta-analysis approach from fixed effect followed by testing for heterogeneity and quantifying it using I squared. Then we did a random fixed meta-analysis to incorporate it and also tried a subgroup analysis uh, just by using, in this case, a follow-up, length of follow-up as, as a factor that may explain. Now, the talk for today is, of course, the meta-analysis, uh, the meta-regression approach. So instead of coming up with one cutoff where here, you know, greater than 8 or and below 8, uh, can we use that as, as a continuous uh, covariate and examine heterogeneity? So here you could see just a trend here as, uh, in fact, the length of follow-up seems to predict uh, the, the, the degree of the, the effect, the treatment effect. If you do a regression approach here, it can be shown that the standardized mean difference decreases by 0 0.2 for each extra week of follow-up with a P of 0 0.08. So I will have another example to, to go through this, but that's the kind of um, results that we are trying to show is relationship between a covariate, in this case the covariate being follow-up, and the treatment effect, the treatment effect being, um, being the standard as mean difference. Okay. So meta-regression is a form of linear regression. So those of you who have done a regression analysis in, in uh, your primary statistical work should have no problem at least understanding conceptually. We are just now merging meta-analytic tools with regression methods. That's, that's basically what it, it entails. So it describes a linear relationship between two characteristics. We predict the outcome variable or dependent variable, as we do in any regression analysis using values of the explanatory variable, also known as independent variable. In fact, we can have several explanatory variables, again, like we normally do in, in regression analysis of primary studies. However, you have to know now in meta-regression, the outcome variable is the treatment effect measure. In the example I just discussed, SMD, the explanatory variable or the independent variable is some summary description of the study. In the example I just discussed, that was duration of follow-up. Just a quick note on treatment effects. So that is going to be our outcome variable or our dependent variable. When you deal with ratio measures, such as odds ratio, risk ratio, hazard ratio, and so on, we perform the whole analysis or the whole regression analysis on a logarithmic scale. So outcome variables now would be log risk ratio, log odds ratio, log hazard ratio, and so on. So and now just to remind you what regression entails, the simple linear regression, you have a y-axis, in this case SMD, the x-axis is the trial duration, and every point you see here is the SMD from, um, from each study. The whole idea is now to come up with a best fitting line using uh, principles from regression analysis, such as um, least squares, ordinary least squares, which I think probably would be familiar to most of you. Why we, we don't use simple linear regression, however, is um, just as in meta-analysis, the studies are different in size, therefore that should be uh, incorporated in our regression analysis. So there is a big difference, for example, between what you see on the left here and what you see on the right. The same number of studies, except now we just changed the size of the study. So here on the left, this and this, these three studies are very large or big studies, whereas on the right hand side, the first one and here, I don't know if you can follow my pointer here, and here are big studies. So because of these three big studies here, the relationship will have here a more uh, um, an upward slope and here, maybe a downward slope. So that's very important to keep in mind. Okay. And that's basically what bubble plots means is these are circles proportion to the inverse of variance. As you know, of course, variance is a function of uh, sample size primarily, but also it includes some, some other quantities such as, you know, event rate in, in binary outcomes, the number of events that 
uh, that are observed in each treatment group. So that's very important to look at such plots to see uh, how the best fitting line should be. So let me now tell you a little bit about what's known as fixed effect meta regression. So like the same way, the fixed effect meta analysis, but now taking the same principle and apply it in the meta regression context. So a fixed effect meta regression is performed using weighted regression. So that means if you have access, so um, so let me see, uh, Adrian is telling me I can use the laser pointer on the whiteboard if I wish. So let's see if now I thought I used it. Uh, let's see. Can you see a laser pointer now? That, can you show me a uh, happy face again? It's very difficult to coordinate both. Okay, can you see a laser pointer X? Oh, one person is saying, okay, I see some happy faces. Fine. So the fixed effect meta regression is performed using weight re regression analysis, where the weight now is the inverse variance of the effect estimate from each study. So in our example, the inverse variance of SMD, standardized mean difference. Now weights are exactly the same as the fixed effect inverse variance meta analysis. There are some technical notes that I will just skip the terms of time. So here the fixed effect meta analysis will have is a common treatment effect underlying and there is of course a random error. What you see here, these are the um the point estimates or the effect estimates from each study. And the point is now to try to build a regression model. Here you see the treatment effect is my y variable or my dependent variable. We'll have an intercept as we normally do in a regression, the slope times x, x being now the independent variable. And our example was uh, follow up. So the conventional way, of course, is explanatory variable or independent variable will be on your x-axis and the treatment effect on, on the y-axis. So any, any, any package, a class, a stata, anything that you, you can use weighted regression analysis with can be used to build the model I just showed you. But there is some problem with this approach, uh, that being a false, uh, the, the risk of false positive finding. In other words, you finding a statistically significant result when there is no relationship in actuality or in truth. So fixed effect meta regression has been shown to lead to a very high false positive rate when there is heterogeneity. Uh, therefore, in fact, fixed effect meta regression is not uh, generally recommended. Just to show you one quick simulation study that Julian did a while ago. Uh, here is a simulation study of false positive rates. On the x-axis what you see is I squared, so from 0%, 50% to 83%. Basically as you go through the I squared axis here, um, this would be probably moderate degree of heterogeneity. This is quite high and what you see here is the fixed effect meta regression instead of uh, finding only 5% uh, the nominal level of uh, significance, that can be inflated quite substantially. In other words, your chance of declaring something is happening will increase substantially as, as it is one pitfall with the fixed effect meta regression approach. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, so what's the solution? The solution is instead of using a fixed effect meta regression, in which case essentially you are saying your covariate can explain all variability, why don't you try random effect meta regression where as, as a simple random effect meta analysis basically you split the, the, the variability. Some of it can be explained by the covariate. For example, in our example, the covariate was follow up. So some of the variability or the heterogeneity may be explained by length of follow-up, but still remains some more heterogeneity. So that's, that is where the random effect meta regression comes in. We now allow extra source of heterogeneity 
above and beyond what we can explain using our covariates. Okay, so it's like a random effect meta-analysis in effect. By comparing a random effect meta-analysis with a random effect meta-regression, you can even determine how much heterogeneity is explained by the explanatory variable, okay, or by, by the independent variable. Okay, so um, I guess I'll skip this one again quickly so that we'll have enough time for questions and answers, but I hope it's clear to you the, the, the main uh, distinction or the main difference between a fixed effect meta regression and random effect is the fixed effect assumes that the covariate that you are trying to explain the heterogeneity captures everything, every heterogeneity. On, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the random effect meta regression splits them into two. There is some part that's explained and there is unexplained part as well. Okay, just so try to to draw analogy with the simple fixed versus random effect meta-analysis. So it's very similar logic. So that's what I mean. So proportion of heterogeneity explained if you have heterogeneity of variance from a simple random effect meta-analysis, like what you can do in in Review Manager, and you could and so you could use other packages to to explain heterogeneity uh, uh, using a random effect meta regression. So let's may call that tau squared bit, tau squared b, and the first one times tau squared a. Uh, the proportion of variance explained now by, by the covariate can be obtained simply by subtracting these two um, uh, variances and scaling them by the the baseline variance, which is the variance explained in the random effect meta-analysis and expressing this as a percentage. Okay, um, so again, so I'll skip this. I'll give you now one concrete example, which you probably have seen it many times. It's a classic example in teaching uh, meta-regression concepts. So this has to do with um, a vaccine for tuberculosis. Uh, that's been done uh, way back in 1995. No, no, I mean this is the first study I mean by Berkey and colleagues, 1995. Uh, let me uh, just quickly go to the next slide. Which has more and more data. Okay. Sorry, I have had issues with with my slide here. Okay, so it's suspected that the distance from the equator affects the efficacy of the vaccine uh, for this uh, tuberculosis vaccine. So here is a detailed uh, data or table. There are, I think, 12, yeah, 13 studies where uh, a group of people who have been vaccinated and others who have not been vaccinated. Here we have the total number with cases of tuberculosis. Um, um, and here, uh, the effect estimate here, or the effect size, uh, is relative risk. You could use odds ratio if you want. As I said earlier, when you deal with this sort of measures, you, used to, you need to use a log scale. In this case, the natural logarithm of relative risk. We have the variance, so within steady variance. So, um, and 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 here the latitude, which is our covariate. So, uh, let me just. Go next quickly. So first, if we just draw the forest plot here. Uh, on the left, favors vaccination. On the right here, favoring non-vaccination. Uh, just eyeballing this forest plot, you can see the, there is quite a substantial heterogeneity. You could follow that using the test. If you want, if you do the test, the test for heterogeneity, the Q test, massive number here, 152, where we expect the number to be roughly around 12, because the number of studies minus 1 is here 12. Of course, the value is very small. If you use just six effect, ignoring uh, this degree of heterogeneity, here is the point estimate with a confidence limit. And under the random effect, here is another point estimate with its own confidence limit. But so this is ignoring heterogeneity, and this is encompassing or embracing, I should say, embracing heterogeneity. But we are not explaining it yet. We're just 
throwing it into uh, that substantial heterogeneity is just dumped into residual variance. So can we do better? Can we explain? If that's the question. So again, I, the I squared in this case is very big, in fact, 92%, suggesting that the observed heterogeneity may be due to real differences between studies can potentially be explained by study level covariance. Is the vaccine more effective, for example, in colder climates? Perhaps because of the theory that persons in colder climates may be less likely to have a natural immunity to tuberculosis. So now let's first see, uh, sorry, again, I'm having trouble with with going back and forth with these slides. What you see on this graph is on the y-axis is the log relative risk, the x-axis is latitude. Just for illustration purposes, here is only the fixed effect, although I told you earlier that's not generally recommended because the fixed effect now says, well, latitude explains everything. So that's not a good assumption and we have seen also the false positive, the chance of false positive is quite 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 large when the degree of heterogeneity is um, the degree of heterogeneity is big, which is the case here as you as you have seen using the Q statistics, I squared, using the forest plot, everything suggests that there is massive heterogeneity. So in that case we ex we expect the fixed effect uh, to, to, to be quite misleading. But just I'm showing you here for uh, just more illustration purposes. What is here is the equation on the right, on the top, I mean here, log relative risk equals, here is the intercept, 0 0.3435 minus 0 0.0292, that is the slope, times x, where x is now absolute latitude. In other words, the distance from the equator in absolute terms. The closer to, to the equator, the temperature is hot. Of course, the further uh, it is, uh, it's cold. But if you just take maybe a couple of examples here, around here, uh, 13 degree latitude uh, would be countries like uh, India, where temperature is quite hot. You'll see here the treatment effect is close to zero in the log scale. Or if you consider, just let's come back to Canada now, around uh, 55 latitude degree, 55 degree latitude would be uh, a, a place like Saskatchewan. Uh, West Canada, that in that case, the, the vaccine is expected to do quite well. Uh, people who are vaccinated will be, will, will benefit more, more than other people in the warmer area. So that is the fixed effect with its limitation, as I said before. Doing, using the same data, we can run a random effect meta regression. And in this case, just happened the slope is in fact identical, but the, the intercept is a little bit different. But the conclusion is very similar that uh, places where the, the temperature is quite, quite hot, that's close to the equator, uh, we don't expect the vaccine to do well, whereas places that are colder, away from the equator, they will have more benefit. One thing to notice here is, see this bubble plot, these are the circles, they are fairly similar in size, as opposed to, let me just go back one more time, to this graph, which is the fixed effect. And you may recall this, this is the case, even without going into meta-regression, when you compare results from fixed effect versus random effect. Random effect tends to spread the, the weight equally as opposed to uh, fixed effect. So some studies that are large will receive higher weight under a fixed effect approach than under a random effect. So very similar. Uh, observation in the context of meta regression. Okay, so basically that is uh, an example, a concrete example. You could now compare uh, how um, now you could take and try to apply it in your own situation. But just before uh, we we I, I stop and open it in terms of some of the problems and pitfalls that a meta regression may have. Uh, so that relates to choice of explanatory variables, confounding, aggregation bias, and lack of power. Very quick. So, in terms of selecting explanatory variables, there are typically many, many explanatory variables to choose from. You have to be aware, be aware of prognostic factors, things, for example, that predict clinical outcome do not necessarily affect treatment effect. And explanatory variables may be missing. That's quite common practical 
problem. So even though you have data on the outcome of interest, so you have the treatment effect, but the factor that you think may explain heterogeneity may be missing for a number of studies. Confounding is a different problem where meta-regression looks at observational relationships, so it's not really a cause and effect analysis like any regression analysis here, it's just association. So what you find is could be maybe subject to other confounding uh, problems, so keep that in, in, in mind. Aggregation bias in some areas also known as ecological fallacy. In other words, what you see at an aggregate level, the relationship may be different if you had access to individual patient data. That's what in a sense means. So here is the relationship between treatment effect and average age, for example. So average age on the x-axis, or ratio on the y-axis. So based on this, you see there is some relationship as age increases, or ratio also increases. But if I had access within individual, it's, the story may be different. So here, average age and odds ratio, this doesn't seem to be an association. So this is what is known as ecological fallacy and uh, meta-regression is suspect to this sort of bias. Okay, quickly again, lack of power. Unfortunately, most meta-analysis, for example, in Cochrane reviews, do not have many studies. So meta-regression typically has low power to detect relationship. Practical guidelines, how do I choose characteristics, how many studies do I need, how many characters can I look, and so on. So I will skip this because you will have access to the slides afterwards, but just say a few words in terms of uh, selecting explanatory variables in practice. You try to specify characteristics in advance as much as possible, like, like subgroup analysis, and try to select a small number. Uh, you don't want to, con you know, to try to include many covariates where you know you have only limited number of studies. So basically I think uh, there's not much difference from advice that is given when you try to do subgroup analysis. Um, a priori, if again the same issue, to use prior knowledge, experience, empirical evidence would be useful. How many studies is this is a very important question that uh, we always get asked. Uh, maybe typical guidance is to have at least uh, 10 studies for each covariate. So if you take this uh, advice uh, for any typical Cochrane review, you may just consider only one potential covariate to explain heterogeneity using meta-regression. In terms of software, uh, unfortunately, the current review manager uh, will not allow you to do uh, any of the things that I discussed, so meta integration is not supported or not available yet in Rayman. Stata, by far, is the best uh, software uh, that I know of. It has a nice one-liner, meta reg is the command, can be done to do, say, random effect meta regression. Other packages, such as SAS, uh, S plus, win bugs are can be used as well. Should you build meta regression results? So of course that depends uh, was analysis pre-specified or post hoc. So asking the, the kind of questions I was discussing. Is there indirect evidence in support of the finding? Is the magnitude of the difference practically important? So that is the you know the most the well known issue of statistical significance versus clinical importance or clinical significance. Sometimes you may show statistically some association is significant, but clinically that association may not be of practical value or may not be of clinical meaningful. So now we're getting close to finishing. Uh, can you include meta-regression in Cochrane Review? Uh, I think the answer is yes. You are encouraged to use meta-regression. You may include bubble plots, the kind of plots I showed you as additional figures in your review. Uh, results should also be presented in additional tables. Uh, some suggestions maybe you could write what the explanatory variable was, what was the slope of that the regression coefficient. In this case, you can change it to the, the, to the effect measure, such as odds ratio, relative risk, give confidence limits, try to uh, also give guidance in terms of proportion of variance explained by this covariate. Uh, extensions, you may want to study control group risk, uh, but this is um, quite problematic because inherently uh, correlated with treatment effect, there are some special methods. Uh, you may, I'll give you one slide with, with a list of readings that you may want to consult. 
uh, for patient level explanatory variables uh, such as age 6, you may need IPD data, that's individual patient data. Uh, one, one other comment here is in terms of calculating p-values for these associations. Uh, there is a test called a permutation test, which is more uh, robust that uh, can be used. I think Stata now can, can uh, allows you to, to calculate p-values based on a permutation test. Okay, so key message to conclude my talk. Meta-regression examines the relationship between treatment effect and one or more study level covariates. Meta-regression is excellent in theory and not that difficult to do uh, in, in, in uh, using packages such as data. However, uh, meta-regression has a number of pitfalls and dangers that you have to be very careful. Uh, it's an observational relationship, so it's not cause and effect. You have, normally, or typically, you have too few studies in a systematic review. That means you may not be able to do a good meta-regression. Too many sources of clinical and methodological heterogeneity, as well as uh, bias in confounding limit its applicability. So here is uh, um, the list of references uh, that, uh, that uh, I alluded to. Uh, some of them uh, are a bit more technical, statistical, others are more practical. So I will stop my session here and uh, will be happy to take a uh, few questions in the next five minutes or so. Thank you very much. So I will release the audio and uh, I don't know, uh, maybe Adrian, you may help me what is the best way to, to, to go from here. Thank you very much all for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph, and yes, I'm with you on the applause as well, and you have some happy faces going through uh, the participant board as well. There was a question, Joseph, that was sent through um, the chat room, and I'm just going to, uh, maybe I'll say the question, and Joseph, you can uh, come back on and respond. The question is, what do you do if data seem not normally distributed, for example, regression of effect size on study follow-up, and most study follow-ups are either three months or six months months, uh, it's not a uh, not real continuous variable. So I wonder if you could come back on, Joseph, to answer that question. Okay, uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Was it the covariate that is an issue or the outcome? See, the covariate is not, doesn't have to have, to have normal distribution. So follow-up or age, we don't impose distribution on the covariate. No, no, the covariate, that's no problem. The normality assumption in any, any regression analysis is on our dependent value, on our outcome. That's why we use the log scale, log odds ratio, log relative risk, and so on. But as far as what we put in on the, on the right-hand side of our regression, model, that's, that's, not a, that's not an issue. In fact, you can have a binary variable, yes or no. For example, you could consider if, adequate, if randomization can explain. Maybe you categorize studies as adequate or inadequate randomization. The same with concealment. So you can even have a binary. Obviously, a binary covariate does not have a normal distribution. So the covariate is not an issue. Thank you. I hope I answered that clearly. Okay, and there was another question that came through the chat room as well. Uh, it is, how do you do meta regression for, for diagnostic meta analyses? And the second part to that question is, uh, can you do it? Uh, can you only do it based on the diagnostic odds ratio? Joseph, if you could come on, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, diagnostic test accuracy, as you know now, is uh, becoming quite popular uh, in, in Cochrane. Uh, uh, there are now tools, uh, handbooks being developed uh, to answer these questions, but in principle, there is no, um, the, the, the issues are the same. So you'll have to choose a, a, an effect measure, a diagnostic test or diagnostic odds ratio being one of them, but there are other ways of uh, quantifying the effect size um, using, it ultimately uses a pair of measurements, the sensitivity and specificity of, of the test. 
So the, the same principles uh, using the, um, the summary ROC curve and so on. So I don't think I can go into much technical, but the principles will apply in the same way. Thank you, Joseph. And we have another question that came through the board. It, it says, um, sensitivity analysis, so they gave an example, allocation, concealment, and meta regression. How do you do this? OK, thank you. Uh, in terms of sensitivity analysis, uh, so allocation concealment, is it uh, like a, uh, has it been dichotomized, like yes, no, uh, or adequate, inadequate? If you have information that can be used to basically it's a subgroup analysis, but in the meta regression would be a, a covariate. So one covariate for allocation concealment. Uh, you don't have to have only just two. You could have more than two. Uh, so you just use uh, dummy variables as, as in standard regression analysis and see if there is a relationship between allocation concealment and and uh, and the effect. So this is like part of the sensitivity analysis, of course, but it could, of course, be also you know, one way of explaining observed heterogeneity because allocation concealment, as we discussed earlier, is one potential methodological uh, heterogeneity or source of heterogeneity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Joseph, I'm going to take this one last question. I'll at least say it through the board and you can come on and answer. Um, and the question is, I'd like to know, is it possible to use indirect comparison data to make better regression to explore dose-response relationship of treatment? Uh, I personally do not have much experience in, in, uh, in direct comparisons, but I have seen people uh, giving talks. It seems that it's possible. It may not be the optimal way. Uh, there are other more, uh, you know, based on Bayesian analysis, for example, uh, that can answer these questions more effectively. Uh, at a recent colloquium, for example, the Cochrane Colloquium, there were sessions uh, that discussed both this frequentist approach using meta regression to do indirect comparisons versus the Bayesian approach. So uh, all indications so far seem to suggest the Bayesian approach might be preferred, but of course that requires a bit more, you know, advanced theory and also the software is not easy to use and so on. So uh, personally, I don't have that much experience to answer this uh, clearly, but. Uh, I think it's it's possible, uh, although it may not be the best approach. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, all the participants on uh, this webinar. Thank you again, Joseph, for your uh, presentation today. Um, I'm going to, uh, when I'm finished here, send you an evaluation form through the Illuminate interface. We would greatly appreciate your feedback on today's session and any suggestions for future webinars. Um, when you receive it, you can just complete it, save it to your desktop, and email it to ccnc-iph at uottawa.ca as well. Um, if you could send us, um, if you wish, uh, a PDF of today's uh, presentation, then I will send it to you by emailing there. There are a few people that have sent it through um, the uh, chat room to me. Because some of you are logged in anonymously, I don't necessarily have your contact information. So if you could email us at ccnc-iph, that would be great. And thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you very much, everybody, for your interest and for, for attending this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, once again for everything you have done. Bye-bye.